Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $15 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leaning managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike a light. Clayton here from XY Advisor with Dean who has flown in from Perth just for this conversation. That's no other reason, right? In and out on the same day. <laughs> You're here for Barron's? I am. Uh, Barron's is an interesting thing. I don't know a lot about it, but from my understanding, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a media or organization is it that right sure is yeah 100 year old publication in the states yeah right yeah. and their goal is to uh promote the best advisors in the world basically yeah so sterling shea who heads up that division of the magazine he's a massive believer in the value of advice so when he joined barons years ago brought the the ranking it's been highly successful in the states they're interested in elevating advice all over the world Awesome. Sounds like people we should know about. So uh, maybe you can facilitate an intro. That'd be yeah, great. for sure. Um, but today what we're actually talking about is one of the interesting things uh, is you've got Broadleaf. Yep. And, um, and before we duck into exactly what that is, high level, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of flux in the industry right now. There's yep. a lot of advisors leaving. There's not so many joining, but yep. perhaps that'll change over time. Um, Valuations are a big, a big topic of conversation. Um, you've got these international players that have, uh, coming in and offering quite large multiples from my limited understanding. Um, you guys are an Aussie based acquisition, um, company. Uh, I'd love uh, the conversation literally just before I got into this room with you was, what does Dean know about uh, valuations that we don't know? Because everyone seems to think it's on the down and out, but then you've got companies like yourself mm. or the externals from overseas that are taking an opposite view. Yeah. So what what makes you uh, and what makes the strategy so bullish on acquisition? Okay, so let's break it apart into a couple of pieces. One is nothing's changed in the field of finance around the way you value an organization. It's based on earnings. So a multiple of earnings, depending on the reliability of earnings, if it's more reliable, higher multiple and vice versa. So I think the second part to that is then breaking this industry-based valuation away from a standard method of valuing an enterprise um, and you can arrive at some fairly different outcomes I, I you know I see this compression discussion whether we are going in the direction of accountancy or legal firms down to say one times revenue the multiple of revenue idea just doesn't make any sense to us I think that's a fundamental point it's all about the earnings of the organization. So do you run a successful business um, as measured by your ability to generate revenue at lower relative expenditure and have some left over that uh, is worth owning as a shareholder? So you're taking the very progressive view that uh, financial planning companies should be valued the same way as all other companies. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's a really new idea. Exactly. We're quite proud of it. Uh, I, no, I think this this really has to be central. There are companies, there are small businesses usually in our space that um, you know might be a a single person with one or two people assisting them to deliver value to clients. 
it may make sense for them to be in a larger organisation. You start to get a different profit profile. Um, whether it's worth one, two, three, four times, I think that's been artif artificially propped by the implicit, not explicit, buyer of last resort model. I know it does exist explicitly, but it's more been that there is that implied valuation underpinned by the big players in the market, which is obviously now gone. Mm. Um, so we need to find another way of thinking about this, I think. Yeah. Um, EBITDA is, uh, you know, it's pretty normal out there in the world. And it always did interest me that um, financial planning, when I sort of got into financial services about a decade ago, uh, it was really interesting to me that it had its own ecosystem. It had its own valuation mm. model. It had its own revenue models and it, it had its own view of acquiring clients. And that really has all been stripped back, I would say, wholesale across everything um, over the last couple of years. Now, you know, people want to acquire clients, uh, or I should say advisors acquiring clients now is much more closer to how uh, the world has traditionally acquired clients uh, rather than just simply um, purchasing books of business and then, you know, converting those orphans into, you know, full member, uh, full, full, um, full paying clients. So these days we're seeing, uh, it's the same way I like to go shopping, same way you like to go shopping. Everyone likes to find uh, information delivered in a, a framework that's easy to understand. You produce, you know, create a relationship with a, an expert and then you go to that person when you, when you need help. And it's amazing seeing so many planners are now acquiring clients in that methodology. Um, but it's also been really amazing to see the conversation go from, uh, revenue, um, to EBITDA. Yeah. And, uh, what has been, like, how long has Broadleaf been doing this? What's yeah. your sort of story and yeah. how big have you guys grown? Okay, so it goes back to our family business in Perth. My father started that uh, in the mid-70s. Um, officially, the company was incorporated in 1979. Interestingly, when he started back then, it was really life insurance. And he tells a story that in his first week of starting in life insurance, all premiums for life insurance were tax deductible uh, personally. And in that week, the government announced that they were basically killing the de deductibility of, of life insurance premiums for individuals. And so the sky was going to fall in. And here we are. Um, that was 1974. <laughs> um, and so then, uh, interestingly, he started our business because he didn't want to be told by people who had no connection with their client, with his clients, what to sell them. Um, 1974, 1975, um, and then the company established in 1979. So it's interesting how these themes remain. Um, 20 years when I started, there was this story that within 10 years, there'd be half the number of advisors in the industry than there was then. So sort of 98, 99, everyone was worried about that sky falling in. And it's funny, things like that just don't eventuate. Um, what we've done with Broadleaf has basically been born out of Gilkerson Group in Perth, which is, um, I mean, I saw this cohort of friends and colleagues of my father um, have no alternative but to sell their business to a larger player. Um, and I think there's a bit too much judgment that goes on now. You know, today's lens um, applied to what people did back 10, 15, 20 years ago, it's just not fair. Um, so what we saw is that if you've got someone with a different profit motive who's the owner of the organisation to who's in service of clients and the clients, it it's fracturous. It doesn't work. There's plenty of evidence to support that perspective. So Broadleaf um, has the intent of keeping the businesses who – um, or well, keeping the ownership of the organization in the hands of those who are directly in service of the client. Um, so it's not a long-term ownership model. It's about actually funding out the incumbent owner 
and bringing in the emerging leaders and then gradually allowing them to buy back that equity over time. We think that's about a 10-year cycle. Um, so really the, the birthplace is I'm an advisor. I deeply value advice. Um, I've got 20-year connections uh, with my clients. I grew up with this um, so all I remember as a kid is that my father was a financial planner or a financial advisor and no one knew what that was. Um, I think the same is true still now. Um, so, you know, the, the way then to facilitate that transfer, um, you know, I don't want to trivialize it, but, you know, it's actually you come to an agreement with the stakeholders that are involved and if everyone's really got the, the client at the center of that, then you can find a path for it. How many uh, businesses have you guys acquired so far? So we're settling on our third uh, at okay, the end so of this Okay, so it's relatively week. a new strategy. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've been working on it for about four years um, and we were really patient in the way we raised our equity capital. Um, so lots of smaller investors and um, you know, I think it was – Cynic, who said something along the lines of, you know, we don't want to, we, we want to do business with people who believe what we believe, not those who just want to buy what we have. 100%. Um, and so we were really patient about that. Um, when you are acquiring good businesses, I think it takes a long time to make sure there's alignment because we want to be adding value rather than extracting value. Um, that means supporting good business people to be good business people and, and practice a pretty high degree of non-interference. So we're very patient, um, though once you start to get a name for what you do, it's funny how the momentum builds quickly. Yeah. Does it come with, I guess, training? Like, are you guys interested in taking a business and cutting down the costs uh it's, it, it, do you guys have a, a coaching overlay to any of this or you're literally just the, the mechanism, the funding mechanism? Yeah, I think the answer is yes to both of those questions, which might seem contradictory. Yeah. Um, practice non-interference, a central belief. Um, yeah. So there's plenty of examples where everyone talks about there will be no interference and on day one, here's the rule book and, yeah. and then everyone gets upset from yeah. there. Um, that's not what we've done, and our reason is that we're acquiring a share in really good businesses, really well-run businesses, highly profitable. Um, some of the things I think we've seen are that if people are positioning for sale, the profitability looks good. Again, these aren't new ideas. Um, so normalizing back the earnings to make sure that they're kind of quote unquote, fully funded business that people are actually investing in the business's future. Usually that means investing in the next generation of people to come through. Um, and so then the overlay of the coaching side of it, um, we've got a, a partnership with another Perth based business called Adapt by Design. Um, that partnership's called Adapt Financial. Um, it's a digital operating system and method for thinking about succession of systems rather than succession of people or that succession is actually about equity or ownership transfer. So in Gilkerson, we, um, we've got this lovely um, test environment where um, up until the 1st of July last year, I was the 100% owner. Um, I now own 10%. Uh, Broadleaf acquired 70 and we use that as a means to actually um, have two people in the business acquire 10% each. So uh, two years prior to that, we'd been working on handing over decision rights. And that means like as a 100% equity owner, I can't outrank or outflank someone. Um, so in the area of financial security or people, for example, there were other people in the organization who had the final say. Um, and so we separated it out to be that decision rights and the transfer of decision rights, which is the stewardship of the organization, which then gives it its value, is very different to the application of your capital. And then add in the thesis that people who are in the business really want to own the business, who want to get the great value that we generate from it as owners, 
it's a pretty nice recipe. Um, it's been so far um, not easy, but so far I think very successful in Gilkerson. Um, to think that, you know, one of my business partners, ownership partners now, um, you know, he joined us four years ago. He's a long-term advisor. He's young and has deep values, alignment, um, aspirationally wanted to be an owner. and He's an equal owner to me. Um, and the other person started 10 years ago as our receptionist hmm. and she runs client services and People think that we're a bit nuts having done this, that you've got a non-advisor as a, an equal shareholder to myself and Chris, um, who are advisors in the business. Um, but what's the difference between Ashley, who basically demonstrates in her working life a deep care and connection with our clients, um, unless she does her job and, and her team does its job, you know, what we talk about doesn't get executed, which devalues the whole thing. Um, why not allow these people to to apply their capital the same way we do? Yeah, that's a really good question. What are the people, like, are you, do you have in your mind the avatar of the person who's trying to sell their business? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think characteristically, it's pretty easy to say older male long-term owner, that's the majority. Um, I mean, I'm very different from that in that I'm probably 20 years younger and there's a lot of older people, my friends and colleagues, who think that I've given up too much. Um, and, of course, it, it, it fails to kind of ask and answer the question, well, what am I gaining? Um, what are the different things that I could be gaining? We assume that we can see what the end result will be of a certain path and we can't. Um, so it's really about having the, the, the willingness to say, well, I believe that it can actually be more in areas that are more than the money. Um, what does that mean? Well, I value what we do. I value the way we do it. If I own everything, will it continue the way I want it to? Will it ever reach aspirationally what I envision? Um, or envisage, um, yeah, I, I just don't think that's true because there's a different degree of energetic participation, this sort of intrinsic, extrinsic motivation conversation. Um, with Chris particularly, there's been a lot of conversations where he can't explain why it changed but says it definitely did. Um, so 30 June to 1 July – something flipped and for him it changed his um his motivation in some way i mean it all, always worked hard but it just it changed something um so that back to that avatar question you know we think it's that person who's been in their business for a long time working away creating a perceived value that's on shaky ground there's nervousness about that i think part of that general characteristic is that oddly we don't take our advice in our industry our profession um you know save from your earnings um there's been a lot of people who've actually been waiting for that end capital event that's not just in our business i mean in small businesses that's a lot of people as well you know course, invest yeah. invest invest and yeah. hope for the end point what we definitely have seen, and it's not just limited to Broadleaf, is when you have that older incumbent in a place of better security financially, their willingness to give back kind of quasi-eldership style is is remarkable. They've got a lot to give and they want to. Um, the, the thing that's standing in the way is the risk that they have and carry, and it's very real. Um, so if you can change that, the way they're willing to invest themselves back into the organisation, usually they founded, um, you know, is is remarkable. Um, as empirically trained leaders as well, not necessarily um, academically trained, and that's hard to get that empirical training. It just takes time. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, yeah. Um, the, the way that XY sort of looks at it is there's a – there's a brain drain happening uh, and we're trying to create the environment where these kind of guys 
can deliver back to the industry, you know, with their the way that they perceive things and as you've said, empirically learnt, which is it's almost you know, it's almost like uh battle hardened stories, yeah, the war right? Stories, yeah. Yeah, that, that you need to sort of keep alive for as long as possible. And then in terms of who the buyers typically are, are you are you going out and find like are people sort of registering, so to speak, with you guys and saying we're looking to buy something or is it alternatively it's just the staff that's currently in the business? Yeah, usually it's the staff that's in the business. That depends on the way we actually uh, filter who we want to partner with. Um, And it goes back to the coaching question as well. I think one of the points that most older incumbent owners are curious about and can't necessarily see a path toward is or through um, is you know, those next generation buyers, what are they going to do? What am I going to give up? Are they going to sort of blow everything up? Because usually those older incumbents hired the younger emerging leader. So it's almost parental. They see still the child, the youngster, the the kid, the the lack of capability, um, you know, the lack of consistency when that's that's often far from the truth. Um, it might be a 10 or 15 year ago or even five year ago uh, mindset. So if you can actually help them through that and also then the the younger, there's lots of younger folk who want the older folk gone um, and, you know, having come through a Jesus. family business, um, you know, there's plenty of times I'm sure my father wanted me gone and vice versa um, and yeah, there's just great value if you can, um, facilitate a different type of conversation because I think everyone shares one common thread, which is about delivering something tremendously valuable to clients Absolutely. and care for clients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems uh, it seems silly to get rid of one or either of those viewpoints. You know, mm. I think I think the the advisors that have been in the game for a long time bring a lot, like just bring so much value. Yeah, uh, and the advisors bring a new way of thinking. Mm. Um, and I think it's just a matter of uh, sort of adapting to the new world, but also not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, and I think this sort of heretical right v wrong way of doing things, there's been tons of different ways uh, over the years. And to say that something was just patently wrong, um, I think is very limiting. Um, you may not agree with it, you may not ever do that yourself, but to sort of cease to examine it in some way or ask loads of questions about it and learn from it, um, yeah, it's a bit short-sighted. It's hard to judge. Maybe it's easy to judge what happened yesterday on the basis of what we think today. Um, maybe that's what the problem is, that it's a bit too easy just to go to a place of judgment. 100%. Uh, one of the things that we've done for as long as I can remember is attempt um, it's not to say that we've always succeeded here, but um, attempt to sort of be impartial to a lot of business models. Yeah. Um, one of the, I guess the huge difference, I would say the huge difference is the older generation was better at sales. The younger generation is better at marketing. And what really that means is because marketing is really only achievable in the new day and age anyway. Yeah. Like the whole idea that you can put content out onto the internet so that people can consume it and get to know you. Yeah. It was impossible yeah. to do back yeah. in the day. Well, I mean, the best you could do was put a logo in a yellow page. <laughs> yeah, like, right. I mean, it's it's not exactly, it wasn't even an option to, to get good at um, marketing uh, back in the day. You know, like it was billboards, it was... Maybe a letterbox drop. Yeah, yeah, literally. Um, and so... So as a result of not being able to develop scalable relationships, um, then the only the other side or the flip side of the coin is you have to accelerate that um, relationship through sales Mm. techniques in person to person. So you you the the skill was always how do I get person from A to B. Um, in the shortest amount of time possible because I have an hour. This yep. is all I have, right? Uh, that's not, that's not, um, the only way to do business anymore. It's, it, there, it, it is still a way, but the, these days, 
with the internet, with social media being the way it is, uh, and with YouTube and all that sort of stuff, I can now put podcasts, for example, uh, or, or videos or blogs or, I mean, and there people can now, I can, div- I can, I can have downloadable ebooks and things like that. And so people can actually, you can send people on a journey that was never available. It just, the technology didn't yeah. exist. Yeah. And so, um, I'm always cautious of looking, uh, at the past through the lens of the modern day simply because the options weren't there. Yeah, I think though the things that we can actually learn when a client called, someone picked up the phone, if there was availability, there was the willingness to say, well, you know, you're in a, you know, you're in a remote spot or you're elderly, I'm going to get in the car, I'm going to come and see you. The old-fashioned way of delivering service because although there's a lot of technology that's been introduced and who knows where that's going to land, I mean, none of us can really um, see that and most probably can't even conceive of what it's going to look like. Still, people want to connect with people. So although sales is usually these days kind of comes with a bit of a, oh, that's a bit grubby, um, the fact remains that we're required to take clients from not knowing us and therefore not being able to trust us. It's not something that we've had an opportunity to develop over time to a place where they're willing to entrust us with their life savings. Their life. Basically, every part of their lives gets touched as a result of what we do. And we have a couple of meetings and then say, well, you know, this is going to cost you X dollars per year, per month, whatever. Please believe in us. Please trust us. It's a massive leap of faith. So the thing that we focus on is, well, what exactly are we selling? Um, and that's that people think at some level something's not okay. They're afraid of something and what they want is to get to a place that they feel better and they feel okay. And that's a repeat process. Um, and then, you know, on the other side, marketing helps with that. I mean, like the whole develop trust digitally. Yeah. Um, that's that's really valid and increasingly valid, especially as client age averages really do fall. Um, you know, and, and also you look at the uptake of people age-wise on social media and the like, it's all the older people in this country or anywhere else in the world for that matter. So having some strategy for presenting yourself in a way that allows people to develop trust before they've even met you. Uh, It makes a heck of a lot of sense. It should give an unreasonable advantage relative to what went on. A hundred percent. Well, that's exactly right. It does have, because uh, the way that I like to explain it is the better your marketing process is um, the smaller the gap that you need to fill with sales. And so back in the day, there was, as we just talked about, a letterbox drop was your was your marketing capability, yeah. right? So, um, so uh, the advantage of being an advisor, being able to uh, find people that already like you and want to work with you to to sort of reflect um, what you were saying earlier about you know Simon Sinek saying you want to work with people that reflect your values. Mm. Um, that's now achievable. So, uh, yeah, I, it's um it's it's always a good thing to to keep the old heads around uh, purely because even though they might not be fully up to speed with the marketing, the service, the, the, the ability the, the ability to give safety and peace of mind, which is a huge part to stop people making bad decisions, you know, that, that is one of the things that I, I think finance advisors find really difficult on how to articulate. And I still haven't figured it out yet, but Oftentimes when I was advising, uh, the most valuable things that I ever did as an advisor was people would come to me with ideas or suggestions or, you know, things that they wanted to achieve. And I, I would sort of say back to them, well, is it the right thing to do? And, and a lot of the times it just wasn't. And I was able to sort of talk them out of these bad decisions. Mm. I mean, older advisors would have seen so much of that, that a young advisor just couldn't even articulate yeah it's years in the chair and i mean i think it goes back to also you made a comment earlier about customer acquisition the 
uh, digital presence, I think, or at least theoretically, is really important when someone is acquiring a book of clients um, because it's it's undoubtable that um, the clients will feel sold and you never can sell a client. No one owns a client. All you can transfer is the opportunity to be of service to someone. Um, and then... You know whether you deliver on that or not is is going to be the determinant of whether you actually get get something back on the the money that you've transferred to someone else for that um, you know air quotes asset. Um, <laughs> really, in a business which is a hundred percent intangible, we've yeah. got goodwill. What accountants would call goodwill. What is goodwill? It's just something that someone's built up over time. It's trust. So. How do you, particularly if you're younger to an older advisor, how do you actually build that quickly? And, you know, what you might lack in sort of the, the gray hair, so to speak, not, not me. Um, <laughs> but, um, what you might lack in gray hair, you make up for in, I get back quickly or I'm there and answer phone calls or I'm consistent and I'm technically a gun. Yeah. And, you know, there's something that someone's able to immediately rely on as an anchoring point which then builds trust that still it seems to us that the most valuable way of acquiring clients is word of mouth if people refer their friends their family their colleagues and they say hey this person is really someone you can trust well you know most of the hard work is done then Again, theoretically, all you're required to do is actually do what you do, yeah. um, and 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 that I I can see that often we collectively can become distracted by that. It's all well and good to have value statements and um, and you know the classic where you just walk past them in the hall, but unless you actually are able to convert your intent to an outcome for someone who's a client, it's really meaningless. Yeah, um, and even with the, um, the the word of mouth referral, if a, uh, it, it makes it makes a current client's job so much easier to refer if they if there is an easy digital journey. So, like, let's say um, I want to refer you to see my advisor, um, rather than me having to say send an intro email, right? Oh, look, I can do that. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But also if I just go, hey, if you go to www.xyz.com, uh, you can see for yourself and then you go onto that website and be like, oh, okay, it's that person. They click on this and they get that thing and then they watch the thing. And then, and then it's almost like it's a risk-free referral from your existing client's point of view because all they've done is nudged and then your whole digital journey takes care of it for them. So word of mouth, 100%, I actually fully agree. It's just even the digital marketing stuff just supports. 100%. In, in, in fact, in fact, what, one of the strategies I think works really, really, really well is if you say to your clients, hey, uh, like any any referrals or word of mouth is really helpful. And in fact, the easiest way for you to do that is if I ever email you a, a, a LinkedIn update, if you could just like it um that that passive uh referral is just so simple and yeah. and typically they're so willing to do that you know completely and yeah. and it's it gives you so much social proof and it's so easy it's, it's like how do i make it simple for my existing clients to word of mouth refer me and, yeah. and using digital means is a really good way of doing that's that. an interesting point it's a digital version social proof yeah. i've never heard that before yeah it's um it's something and and to, i got down to the specific so uh rather than just sort of making this uh, uh, like an ethereal concept that as long as the person uh, you know is happy to do that what i would then do is actually copy the url of my LinkedIn update and email it to them one on one and be like, "Hey, this is a thing. Is it okay? like if you feel comfortable, it'd be great for you to to click on that and like it." And then every all, their entire network is seeing yeah. that they're liking my stuff and it's curiosity of who's in their network. I think though uh, a one on one version of that because I think everyone's had the experience where I say, "Well, I'm going to refer you to my advisor." And so I give you the name, number, contact details, 
and you never do anything with it because yeah. you're living your life, you're busy. Um, I might have spotted something. So really it's my agenda, not yours necessarily. Yeah. And if I can actually make a connection where there's two people digitally meeting, we've found that to be huge value because then we will take it upon ourselves to um, to, to take that load off someone, off a potential client because um, they're busy. So we just do what we do. We give them a call. We send them an email. We direct them to a website. We ask them if they've seen that. We we will say to them, all we want to do is make this easy. And most people say, thank goodness, I've been meaning to do this for ages. I should have done it. So we've found that to be really successful. And, and as you say, you know, it's not one thing. It's almost like being ambidextrous. Definitely. Yeah, you yeah. need both. Yeah, correct. Um, I've got some questions for you regarding where you think the future of advice is. So mm -hmm. for me, um, you know, there's the whole adage, if, you know, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. And you, a lot of the market is fearful right now, but you're probably taking the, the zag to the zig approach. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you guys are, have raised capital, you're interested in purchasing. So um, I've got some questions. Hopefully you've got some insights. Yep. Um, where do you see uh, fees from super going? Okay, so uh, again, pretty hot topic. Um, and I think it's, it's difficult to be um, one size fits all with this because uh, if you put forward a question, well, what about a 32-year-old couple who've got one child and another on the way, they need cash flow help, um, they need insurance, they need their estate planning taken care of, they're not talking about retirement planning, they haven't accumulated their assets yet, they've got high debt levels. What's the value of advice for them and is a source of providing that advice in terms of funding the cost of that advice, um, is that super? I mean, I can make a lot of sense out of that. Um, there's a requirement for super funds to meet the rules that have been created. So it has a certain set of uses. So it's undeniably incorrect to be using super as the funding mechanism for advice holes bolus. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that in certain instances. Um, so where is it going to go? Um, I don't know. There's, yeah, again, it's sort of heretical to, to have a position on either side, it seems, <laughs> these days. It, it lacks good, sensible conversation because, again, I can find a place where it could be super useful, pardon the pun, for younger people with older clients. I mean, I, I think it's been the obvious target for people to charge fees for delivering very little. That's not a new idea either. That's no. been going on for decades. Um, I don't agree with that either. So as long as it can be rationalized, justified, linked to value, that clients are clear in their choices um, and, and conscious in that, you know, I think that's going to solve a lot of things. Um flimsy answer right <laughs> Very de political. De well deliberate <laughs> uh yeah um here's another one what do you think about insurance commissions and and the reason i'm interested in these answers from you is because obviously like if you if you've got the business model that you want to acquire and get more exposure to this industry yeah that's why i think it's kind of interesting to get your views on these so mm -hmm. um so yeah insurance commissions where do you think that's headed um well We've not, in Gilkerson, we've not charged insurance commissions for, I think it's about 15 years. Wait, so to, to be clear on what that means is you haven't received any money from insurance companies to give insurance advice for 15 years? Correct. Wow. So we charge fees. Yep. There are clients we've taken on who have existing policies that you know aren't to be changed for varying reasons where we'll refund. Um, we've got a 41-year-old business and counting, right? So to to cope with that legacy without leaving clients disenfranchised is not, it's not trivial. Um, so I'm not saying that we don't receive any commissions. And again, this is a, a good point to be coming from because I've got people who I, colleagues and friends who I respect highly who have the business model where they 
charge fees and they accept commissions. And again, as long as the client is aware of what's going on and they understand what the, the end effect is for them financially, who's to say it's the right thing or the wrong thing? I have a preference of the way I like to do things myself. Um, people around me and in our business align with that. We've found that it's been really successful in our business. I, I I totally accept that it's difficult, if not impossible, to run an insurance-only offering on a fee basis, um, and that's really because of the psychology of it. It's hard for people to overcome paying a significant amount up front to save on a monthly basis, and, you know, that's telemarketing and, you know, it's everywhere. It's not just in our field. Um, where do I think it will go? Um, I think it will depend on the next big um, upset that occurs in the world and then kind of popular policy moving us towards an outcome and we'll be required to respond. I think that's sad. It takes away options for, for clients and if we actually go through this next wave of professional development, professionalism development, um, you know, I can't understand why you would just say, well, this is the wrong thing and that's the right thing and give people the option. The one party that seems to be absent from this debate is the end client. What do you want, Mr. and Mrs. Client? What would you have? What options would you be afforded? Um, I haven't seen a lot of that going on. Mm. In terms of a professional year, because uh, in order for the, uh, the advice industry to continue to move forward we're going to need to see more than i think it was five new advisors joined the industry last year something like that on the on the financial advisor register um so we're going to need to come up with some level of uh, system to get this logbook done and everything like that is this something that you've uh, looked at at all uh, do you have an opinion on it um firstly i believe in ongoing education um i i hear a lot of people bemoaning what they, they have to do. I mean, you don't have to do anything. No one's making you. And the choice is whether you want to be in this profession doing what we do professionally. It's it's undeniable there's a requirement or benefit to continue to learn, um, whether that's secondary education or CPD or you know, whatever. Um, I don't think many people in a new era are going to have much much of a problem meeting the conditions. Um, I think the professional year is a great idea. I mean, look at the whole, um, the idea of apprenticeships. Um, you do four years as an apprentice totally. most of the time. Um, and that sets people up for success in their field. I think there's huge merit in that. I think it forces the older to cease to hold so tightly the knowledge that they do possess, that they're they're able to transfer that in a structured rather than an unstructured way. Um, you know, I think the FPA have done a pretty good job in developing and they continue to develop um, their model for this. One way? Is there one way? I don't know. I think if you can actually take uh, any method and objectivize the discussion about what you're doing, why you're doing it, link it to some... Um, some objective think about what we do professionally it seems that we don't do this on ourselves whether it's in the field of education or you know our own um, personal development as well um, one of the things that we've done in um, in Gilkerson using the adapt method is to have um, personal pathway conversations at regular intervals career evaluations so people are measuring um, personal fit, cultural fit, professional, mentoring, financial progression required to put a narrative to these things. Again, it, it brings people to an anchoring point and they can set some goals and objectives and and then they're being tested against that. I mean, um, if you drift, you drift. Um, so adding adding some structure that the for the professional year or if you've missed your CPD, the FPA have a, a questionnaire, it's sort of six or seven pages about what you 
what you want to achieve, what your knowledge gaps are, what you're excited by or interested in. There's some great questions in that that you can use to um, to structure something well. Yeah. Um, and so I guess, what, and, and the main reason I wanted to have this conversation with you is uh, I'm pretty bullish on face-to-face financial advice moving forward. Um, human beings being human beings, there's just always, 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 always going to be a large segment of society that wants to deal with people rather than technology. Yeah. Um, and it's always good to see, at least from where I'm seated, at a time where a lot of advisors are scared that there are uh, business strategies out there that are saying, actually, well, if you're really scared, come talk to us because we're not scared. Mm. And I think that's a really good message for the industry as a whole. So I guess uh, my last sort of really specific question I'd like to ask you is, where do you see advice uh, five years from now? Um, I think we will have come through this post-Royal Commission almost vacuum where we find ourselves um, clamouring for what's right and wrong. I see this development phase of education leading us to a point where uh, maybe, and and this might be over-optimistic, um, we can actually arrive at a point where disclosure isn't so um, prominent and significant and, yeah. and stringent. Um, you know, I, I can easily imagine a world where if we're meeting professional standards and we're championing that, not because we're told we have to, because we want to, and we're 10, 15, 20 years out from the legislation, um, you know, if there's a, a clear and consistent delivery of professional guidance and service, well, it diminishes the requirement for a baseline of, of disclosure. You know, I can really easily see that in a five-year period. I, certainly, there's going to be an excess of the older advisors, which, again, it leaves us vulnerable to inexperience. Um, most people under 50 these days have never been in business through a recession. Um, and I mean a no. sort of end of 80s, yeah. early 90s or kind of mid-early 70s recession, um, that battle hardenedness that you mentioned before is is missing. Um, the technology side of it, I mean, obviously there is a strong argument for using technology and I'm a big advocate of that. I'm also at the same time a massive believer in the face-to-face like you um, you know, I don't kind of, I, I don't do the online shopping thing. Um, <laughs> my business partner, Richard's quite, uh, quite, quite prominent in that. He's got um, an Amazon Prime account. Oh, I don't know. It's more the iconic, I think. Oh, right. um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, what we're, what we're seeing is that you're going to need to use technology to improve the speed and accuracy of what you do to rationalize and justify. And I, I think of, Say lifetime cash flows, just as an example. Great. A computer can do that already. If you put in some variables, they can do that without human, human input or, you know, any kind of advisory uh, intervention. What then doesn't get done is the conversation about, well, how are you going? How are you feeling? What matters? Why does that matter? Why does it matter today? Will it matter tomorrow? What could change that? Um, those variables are really hard to capture without a human-to-human conversation. There's those people who would argue differently. Um, but I think just like when I started and there was going to be this mass exodus of advisors and all this disruption that was going to occur, same thing, you know, nearly 50 years ago when my father began, um, it was all going to change. Um, it doesn't, and I can tell you that's not with my head, me with my head in the sand. I proudly believe in what we do and the way we do it, and I don't think that it's easy to take that away. Um, and if we're able to use technology to improve that constantly, wonderful. Where I think that will impact is that it will compress fees. So um, important to be thinking five, ten years out on how can we actually deliver. Most businesses would deliver to, you know, three, four, five hundred client families. What about a thousand? What about ten thousand? How can you do that effectively, high quality, high value? 
um, en masse because there's so many people as yet unadvised. Um, though I think advice will prevail. Absolutely. It, uh, even when I was, um, I think, no, I'm too old for this to be at uh, high school, so I'm going to go with university. Uh, at university, the the conversation was, even at that stage, um, less to do about access to information but more about the management of information because of the overwhelming nature of our access to all answers who are you paying to make sense uh, of the answers you need to your situation Mm. Uh, health um, wealth you know what you want to do for a holiday Uh, that i think is the more as you know we i think the west is becoming very good at uh identifying what it is that you want to be doing with your time time is more valued these days and so we're working hard uh and with there there's a pool of money um and you've got to fit in family hobbies relaxation you've got to fit a lot of these things in a lot of tick boxes to tick and It requires skills that an individual does not entirely have by themselves. They need to ask for advice. Uh, Once upon a time, that was sitting around a campfire asking your uncle. Uh, These day and age, um, you can get advice on many different things. And I think in terms of what to do with your money and those uh, choices and where your life ends up as a result of those money choices, I think... Uh, the value prop on what that is is becoming more clear, uh, mm-hmm. not less. A lot of people are scared of this idea that uh, technology will solve all these problems. Ain't a chance because uh, y- y- you're never going to look at a screen, even if it's the best graphics in the world, and feel connected. No. You- you're going to always need a person talking to you. Yeah. And... Um, Hence why I'm really bullish on advice and it's hence why it's really good to hear that there are other people that are bullish on advice as yeah, well. Yeah, so Stephen Fry, the uh, the British writer and, and actor, he calls it option paralysis. And I, I think that's really true. I mean, you look at a beautiful picture on a screen and you're going to make a decision about your life savings because of that. Um, for me personally, I feel... Uh, huge value from someone saying, yep, steadying hand, yep, that's cool, it's going to work, this is why it's going to work, this is what we've considered. And again, if you get to know someone over time, you've built that trust that they know you, understand you, get you, understand your family. Um, That stuff really matters. I I see that there's no diminishing value there. Yeah, 100%. Um, thanks so much for, uh, again, flying all the way over from Perth for just this podcast. Yeah. I'm totally kidding. Yeah. Um, best of luck. I assume uh, if you're at the Barons tomorrow that I assume you're potentially up for an award? Uh, no, no. So oh, uh, just, just enjoying the, the, the trip? Yeah, supporting. They, they put on a great summit. Um, there's some excellent speakers. Sterling and his team, um, they do a tremendous job. Um, it's great value. Uh, so supporting him and the team, um, yeah, over here to enjoy that and catch up with people and sort of deepen relationships. So Awesome. Well, I've got to learn more. I've heard a lot about these guys, so it'd be great to uh, meet them. But thank you so much for coming on. I think um, what you're doing is a really good thing for the industry. And if anyone's out there and they want to reach out to you to find out more, how yep. would they go about doing that? Uh, website for Broadleaf, uh, broadleafgroup.com.au. Um, you can check out gilkersongroup.com. Um, contact details are there. So, yeah. Excellent, mate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.